where you see the passing of time. Three crowds in St. Peter's Square are praying like mad for the Pope's life. Where moments refuse to die. This is a momentous hour in world history. This is the invasion of Hitler's Europe. And where victory lives on. Plenty of girls are being kissed by plenty of boys they don't know, and they do not care. You can love it, hate it, embrace it, or turn away. Lennon was shot to death late last night outside his apartment building. But it is a past we all share. Come on out here and give me a salute. Big baby salute. This is where yesterday has a home, where we wonder what it was like back then. Go forward, knights in safety. And not too long ago. His spirit must live on. It's where history has its place and where the past comes alive. The History Channel. The history of America's trains is one of triumph and dynamism, but it is also one of terror and disaster. By the first decade of the 20th century, the death toll for train-related accidents climbed to more than 12,000 people in a single year. Peril has always been a passenger on the railroads. The steam locomotive was invented in England during the first three decades of the 1800s. But it wasn't long before businessmen in America became convinced of its profitability. Trains could haul more freight and travel faster than horses or boats. And they weren't halted by harsh winters when waterways often froze and roads became impassable. Unlike the British, however, early American railroad management stressed swift construction over safety and workmanship emphasis was placed on expansion, on new mileage. Um, the motive behind all of this was uh, money. And so the railroads expanded just as fast as they possibly could. In many instances, the federal government subsidized this expansion. So as they were expanding, they were not building as carefully as they should have. The government granted credit and land to railroads only after track had been laid. The faster the companies completed track, the quicker they could obtain these loans and claim more real estate. This produced track with sharp bends, steep and bumpy grades, and flimsy construction. The railroad has been so badly constructed that accidents are continually happening by the cars getting off the track, by upsetting, and by other modes by which passengers are often injured and sometimes killed. J.S. Buckingham, an English traveler, describing his American train trip in the mid-1800s. In the early days of railroading, Track was made by simply mounting strips of iron on top of wooden stringers. It was called strap rail. Strap rail could easily loosen and was the cause of many derailments. Broken, it was also known to ram like a spike through the bottom of a car's floor as a train passed over it. This dangerous occurrence was called a snakehead. The use of wood to fuel the fire in the engine created another railroading hazard. Smokestacks from the engines regularly poured burning embers over passengers, luggage, and property bordering the tracks. Often animals strayed in front of moving trains, causing them to derail. To end this problem, the cow catcher was invented. It was a characteristic feature of American locomotives never seen in Europe. 
In 1833, the John Bull became the first locomotive to be fitted with a cow catcher. Despite all its difficulties, the safety record of rail travel in the early 1800s was a good one. From about 1830 to roughly 1850, was remarkably free from serious accidents. There weren't very many trains running, uh, they were short. Uh, trains did not run very fast in those years either. 15 miles an hour, maybe 18 miles an hour was sort of tops. The first railroad engine built for commercial use in the United States was named the Best Friend of Charleston. It ran along a 136 mile link between Charleston and Hamburg, South Carolina which was the longest stretch of rail in the world at the time. It was called the South Carolina Road. On June 17, 1831, the locomotive was pulling a train of passenger cars when the firemen became irritated by the loud hissing of the steam being released from the engine's boiler. To silence it, he forced the safety valve closed and the boiler exploded. Fireman became the first American killed in a train accident. On November 11, 1833, James C. Stedman became the first passenger fatality when the train he was riding on derailed after breaking an axle traveling at the considerable speed of 20 miles per hour. Former President John Quincy Adams was on board but was uninjured. A second celebrity, Cornelius Commodore Vanderbilt, was also among the passengers who were tossed and battered in the wreck. Vanderbilt had amassed a fortune owning steamboats and disliked railroads immensely. In a strange twist of fate, Vanderbilt later became one of the greatest railroad barons of his time. He ruled over the New York Central Line from 1867 to 1877. During the first 20 years of American railroading, there were fewer than 50 fatalities. This gave the companies and the public a false sense of security. The industry's unsound construction methods remained the key ingredients in a recipe for disaster. The trains were getting longer, uh, the locomotives were getting heavier, uh, they were faster, um, and there were more of them. So there was a much greater chance that they were going to bump into each other. There was a tremendous uh, chance that uh, rail beds would fail under those heavier, faster loads. And so in 1853, uh, the, the toll in uh, passengers and railroad employees killed uh, was greater than the entire 25 years of railroading up to that point. On January 6th, the first serious wreck of 1853 occurred. A noon express on the Boston and Main Line was traveling at the astonishing rate of 40 miles per hour. Heading to Lawrence, Massachusetts, it broke a wheel and derailed at Andover. There were only three fatalities, but because the train was carrying a prominent passenger, the incident became a major news story. Newspapers across the nation trumpeted headlines stating that President-elect Franklin Pierce had been killed. In Washington, Congress adjourned out of respect for the man who was to have become their president in a matter of days. But the future president actually survived. It was Pierce's 12-year-old son who was the victim. Just short of two months later, another fatal accident occurred. In railroad operations in the 19th century, if a train was overcrowded, if it was sold out, and there were more passengers that needed to, to travel, the railroad operators or managers would simply add another train. And it followed behind the other one uh, at not too far a distance. And this doubling up of trains on the same service uh, could result in a real major accident, and it often did. On March 4th, the Pennsylvania Railroad added a second train to their schedule in order to accommodate a large number of emigrant passengers. During the journey, the train developed mechanical problems and was forced to stop. 
a second train suddenly slammed into it from behind. Steam passages from the engine's boiler were ruptured, and many victims were scalded terribly. Seven people died. It was the greatest loss of life from a train wreck up to that time. The most infamous wreck of 1853 took place on May 6th. It is considered to be the first great bridge disaster. At South Norwalk, Connecticut, a drawbridge over the Norwalk River was opened to allow a steamship to pass. A New York and New Haven train ran through the open drawbridge, plunging into the waters below. It had been only 300 yards short of its destination at Norwalk's depot. The signal for safe passage over the bridge would have been indicated by a bright red ball hanging high from a pole. Witnesses later testified that the ball had been in the lowered position, indicating the drawbridge could not be crossed. The engineer should have stopped his train. Initially, reports were circulated that renowned poet and surgeon Oliver Wendell Holmes had perished in the wreckage. But once again, the stories of a celebrity dying proved untrue. Not so lucky were the 30 doctors from the American Medical Association who were returning by train from a convention in New York City. Five of their number were among the 43 victims who were crushed to death or drowned in the catastrophe. Throughout 1853, railroad accidents continued to occur. Eventually, the number of fatalities reached 253. From this time on, train disasters in America were a fact of life and death. By the middle of the 19th century, railroads were on their way to becoming the largest industry in America. In 1850, more than 40 manufacturers were building locomotives, and an estimated 3,000 steam engines were crisscrossing the countryside on 9,000 miles of track. Ten years later, these numbers had tripled. In 1860, approximately 9,000 locomotives were in use, and 30,000 miles of rail had been laid. But safety appliances were introduced more slowly. The kerosene-burning headlamp became an aid to night travel. A swiveling set of wheels called a lead truck was placed at the front of the locomotive. The lead truck reduced derailments by keeping the train on the track when it was navigating curves. In those days, it was common for trains traveling in opposite directions to occupy the same track. Early railroad regulations dictated that when a conductor believed another train was approaching, he had to order his engineer to stop and wait in an area of track called siding. Only after the approaching train had passed could the order to proceed be given. Sometimes the wait lasted hours, with every minute costing the company money. In 1851, the telegraph was used for the first time to send information about the location of an oncoming train. The messages received by telegraph made it possible to decide whether a train could proceed safely without having to wait. This was a major development in rail safety. Unfortunately, it took many years and many lives before the telegraph was universally adopted by the railroads. In the meantime, the railroads used timetables to dispatch and locate trains. There was a difficulty with the system, however. Time was not yet standardized. Timetables were based on local time, which varied from community to community. When the sun was directly overhead, it was noon. In the state of Illinois alone, there were 27 different local times. Wisconsin had 38. It has been estimated that at one point, the railroad scheduled trains using as many as 100 different times. The confusion this caused led to many disasters. In 
A crash at Camp Hill, Pennsylvania on July 17, 1856, was due to a conductor not paying strict attention to his timetable. Uh, it was an outing of a, a large extra of uh, children who were on their way from their church in Philadelphia to a picnic. And uh, along the way, their engineer disregarded timetable and uh, ended up uh, coming around a corner to find the, the scheduled train uh, directly in front of him. And 67 people were killed in that wreck, uh, mostly children, mostly burned. A telegraphed message relaying the positions of the two trains could have prevented the disaster. The conductor of the scheduled train was so distraught that before the day was out, he committed suicide by swallowing arsenic and morphine. Ironically, he was later absolved of any wrongdoing. Instead, a jury placed the blame on the conductor of the train carrying the children. His train was 23 minutes late at the time of the Camp Hill wreck. In fact, throughout the history of railroads, human error has always been the major cause of train disasters. The engineers were made into heroes because they ran the biggest, most important machines in this country. In fact, the engineers were not all that different than young men with their sports cars today who drive them too fast. America's most famous engineer was Casey Jones. Casey, whose real name was John Luther Jones, was an engineer for the Illinois Central Line. On the night of April 30th, 1900, Casey died trying to make up time on a run from Memphis, Tennessee. The wreck occurred when he rounded a curve near Vaughan, Mississippi, and saw a freight train on the track in front of him. Casey told his fireman to jump, then grabbed the whistle and brakes and rode the train into history and song. Casey Jones mounted to the cabin as he took his farewell journey to the promise. The railroad didn't like Casey very much. Uh, Casey wrecked one of their locomotives. He was typical of the engineers of that period. The important thing was to get the train over the road, make up time. And if you needed to sort of skirt the rules a little bit, then you do that. But that shows you the attitude of both railroad labor and railroad management in those days. If you could get away with it, management loved you. If you didn't get away with it, you were dead, and they wrote you off. The overwhelming majority of railroad fatalities have been employees, not passengers. Train crews often worked hard, long shifts. Stories of wrecks caused by a sleeping engineer behind the throttle were common. The engineer and fireman were always the first ones to die in a head-on collision. Another hazardous job was stopping the train. This duty belonged to the brakeman, because the engineer could not apply the brakes from the locomotive. And when the engineer would signal down brakes, these guys would snap to action to the top of these cars and begin turning wheels that set the actual mechanical brakes. And then, after they had set the first brake, they'd have to move to the next car. And they were on top of these cars, uh, no matter what the weather, whether it was cold or hot, whether it was windy or icy or snowy, dark. Uh, that's why there weren't very many old brakemen. The brakeman was also responsible for coupling the cars. This required him to stand between two cars as they came together. A great many brakemen were crushed. It has been said that it was rare to find experienced brakemen who still had all of their fingers. Because the passenger cars were made of wood, fire was another cause of injury and death in 19th century train accidents. They were heated with coal stoves so that in any kind of serious wreck, a derailment of any sort, the car would tip and the coal stove would tip over, scattering these red hot coals all over the place. People were trapped in the wreckage, couldn't get out, and burned up. One of the worst train fires occurred on a dreary December 18th in 1867. A service known as the New York Express was traveling eastbound along the eastern shore of Lake Erie at Angola, New York. 
Just as the train was nearing a bridge which spanned a frozen creek, a faulty axle caused the last car to derail. With many passengers on board, the car was dragged sideways along the bridge. It eventually uncoupled from the rest of the train and careened 40 feet down the slope toward the creek. When the car struck the bottom of the ravine, the two stoves inside broke apart. Searing hot coal spilled out over the wooden car and its occupants. The icy slope made it impossible for rescuers to reach the victims in time. 42 passengers perished at Angola. In the annals of train disasters, the wreck of the New York Express is remembered as the Angola Horror. In the aftermath of Angola and other catastrophes, a 21-year-old inventor named George Westinghouse increased his efforts to develop a new braking system. The brakes would be operated entirely by the engineer from the cab of the locomotive. A year and a half later, Westinghouse patented his air brake. It was the single most important advancement in railroad safety. In years to come, it would save countless lives. The 1869 advent of the air brake meant fewer train disasters were a real possibility. Railroad workers, however, were hesitant to accept the air brake because brakemen could lose their jobs if the engineer controlled all the train's brakes by himself. Railroad management was reluctant to convert the industry from one standard to another because of the enormous cost involved. It took years of disastrous accidents before air brakes were widely used by the railroads. The telegraph was another safety device available at the time, but not always used by the railroads. A telegraphed message could have prevented many terrible accidents, including one on August 26, 1871. That day, rail traffic had been particularly heavy to and from the Boston area. The number of regularly scheduled trains had been increased from 152 to 192 in order to accommodate passengers attending two revival meetings and a military gathering. A local train was pulling out of the Revere Depot when suddenly an Eastern Railroad Express slammed into it from the rear. Many passengers were killed instantly, while others were scorched by the boiler's escaping steam. When the fire that ensued was finally extinguished, the death toll had reached 32. Throughout the Civil War, the telegraph had proven itself effective in preventing accidents. At Revere, a telegraphed message could have warned the engineers that they were sharing the track with other trains. Eastern Railroad's reluctance to adopt the telegraph cost the victims their lives. But ultimately, disasters such as the accident at Revere forced the railroads to improve safety conditions. The 1871 Revere wreck resulted in public indignation meetings. Uh, it was uh, put down to deliberate murder by the, the clergy in the pulpits in, in Massachusetts. Uh, Charles Francis Adams, who was one of the commissioners of the uh, Massachusetts State Railroad Commission, actually went as far as to say that the, the people who were responsible for running a single-track railroad without using the telegraph for dispatching should be criminally liable for what happens on that railroad. The Revere crash was only one of many train disasters which captured the imagination of the public and the press of the day. From the 1850s on, uh, there were a great number of accidents, horrible accidents. These were reported in the press of the time, the daily newspapers, in the journals such as Harper's or Leslie's and Ballou's. They followed every accident very closely and reported on these in the most sensational kind of journalism. The descriptions of chaos seen at train wrecks were accompanied by illustrations showing bodies flying through the air and lying in agony at the side of the tracks. By 1875, 
journals began to report the number of wrecks. The Railroad Gazette established that 1,201 accidents had occurred that year. This included 104 head-on collisions. A national census report, however, put the total much higher at 8,216. This meant, depending on which article someone read, there were at least three and as many as 22 train wrecks every day. But the worst was yet to come. The quality of bridge construction in the 1800s was as inconsistent as any other part of the track. Although some strong stone viaducts of the period continue to carry rail traffic even today, Early wooden and iron bridges could be flimsy and became the scenes of numerous rail accidents. The infamous Angola horror of 1867 had involved a train wreck on a bridge along the Lake Shore Line. Nine years later, another bridge on the Lake Shore Line would once again be a scene of tragedy. But this catastrophe proved to be even more disastrous than Angola. It happened a quarter of a mile east of the depot at Ashtabula, Ohio, not far from Lake Erie. On the night of December 29th, 1876, the Pacific Express was fighting its way through a violent gale, which raged from Lake Erie across northeastern Ohio. The train's destination was Chicago. The train's two locomotives and 11 cars were crossing the bridge over frozen Ashtabula Creek when suddenly the engineer heard a terrible crack and felt the track sink below him. Instinctively, he forced the throttle wide open, hoping to outrace a terrible fate. He had barely enough time, however, to look back and witness the other engine and all 11 cars plunge 75 feet down into the abyss. In spite of the roaring storm, Ashtabula's townspeople could hear the horrendous crash and came to the rescue. But in the confusion and rush to pull victims from the mountain of splintered wood and twisted iron, available firefighting equipment was left unmanned. The inevitable blaze that followed claimed those who had not already died on impact. 52 passengers lived through the ordeal. Many were taken to the Hotel Antler where they received medical attention. The official death toll was 83. But all the survivors agreed that as many as 70 more people were missing in the wreckage. An investigation found that faulty bridge construction caused the disaster at Ashtabula. Blame was placed on those who had built it. Charles Collins, an engineer for the Lakeshore Railroad, had questioned the bridge's construction when it was being built. But the man in charge, Amasa Stone, gave orders to have it erected anyway. Collins then did his best to make it safe. Because of their prominent positions, neither man was prosecuted. But two days after giving testimony, Charles Collins was found dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Five years later, Amasa Stone also took his own life. In the wake of Ashtabula and other disasters, something had to be done to make train travel more efficient and safer. A meeting of railroad superintendents known as the General Time Convention was held in Chicago. There, the decision was made to adopt standard railroad time. A little over a month later, on November 18, 1883, standard time went into effect. It divided the country into four zones, each one an hour apart, and it eliminated more than 100 local railroad times. Other safety measures were also being adopted in the 1880s. More trains were using air brakes. Dangerous coal stoves were being replaced by steam heating systems. Old and brittle iron track was being converted to stronger steel. And a device called the torpedo signal 
was placed on tracks and burst when a train ran over it. This signal warned engineers that a disabled train blocked the track ahead. For the first time, improved railroad safety seemed possible. But in reality, things were going to worsen before they got better. On a hot, dry August 10th in 1887, an excursion train from Peoria, Illinois, was carrying 600 holiday-bound vacationers to Niagara Falls. At a quarter to midnight, the train was passing a number of culverts three miles beyond the town of Chatsworth when an engineer noticed a flickering light ahead. The railroad crews had been out burning weeds uh, earlier in the day and had inadvertently set one of these culverts on fire. The engineer is moving along with his train and he sees a fire in the distance and then begins to realize that in fact it is the bridge he's about to, to cross. The bridge held long enough for the first locomotive to cross before it collapsed, taking the second locomotive and nine of the train's 15 wooden cars with it. 82 passengers died in the wreckage. Most of the victims were crushed as each car thrust itself into the one in front of it. Premier among the, the horrors of traveling in 19th century railroads was something we call telescoping. It results when a car is crushed and pushed ahead violently into the car ahead of it, like the sections of a telescope would if you were to collapse it. In such an accident, it was about 100% fatalities. The devastation caused by telescoping at Chatsworth never would have happened if the railroad crew burning weeds had made sure their fires had been extinguished. Another oversight by a railroad employee was the cause of a runaway train wreck in 1893. During the late 1800s, Walter L. Main was the proprietor of one of the largest train circuses in America. Among the troop of 300 were midgets and acrobats, who performed gymnastic feats astride many of the show's 130 horses. The circus also featured a menagerie which included elephants, lions, a zebra, and other exotic animals. On the night of May 29th, the circus train was winding down the eastern slopes of the Allegheny Mountains toward the town of Tyrone when its brakes began to fail. Realizing his train was out of control, the engineer began to blow the whistle to warn the members of the circus and local inhabitants of a possible crash. An S-shaped curve at a point called McCann's Crossing proved to be too sharp. Car after car flipped off the track and plunged down a 40-foot embankment. When the roar of the crash subsided, five people were dead, and the bodies of 60 horses were strewn along the hillside. Other animals broke free and escaped. Hannah Friday went out to the barnyard to milk the cows. She saw a shadow out of the corner of her eye, and it was a Bengal tiger in full charge of her and the cow. She leaped from her milking st stool and ran to the safety of the home, and her and her family could only watch as the Bengal tiger made breakfast of their cow. Before descending down the mountainside, a railroad superintendent had determined the train had sufficient braking power. However, he was never told that the train's cars were twice the length and weight of a normal car. Had he been aware of the potential problem, he would have increased the train's braking power by adding a second locomotive, and the Walter L. Main Circus train most likely never would have derailed. At the turn of the century, safety benefits gained through new regulations, and better equipment were constantly being canceled out by other forces. Better track meant railroads could run faster trains. The gradual implementation of stronger steel cars meant more freight was hauled. Greater efficiency gained by scheduling trains using standard time meant management ran more trains without providing more track. Therefore, wrecks continued to occur on a daily basis. In 1890, there had been 6,335 railroad fatalities. But in 1917, 
Over 10,000 people were killed working on, struck by, or riding American trains. The following year, 1918, the death toll reached more than 9,000. The worst train disaster in American history took place on July 9th in 1918. Minutes after departing from Nashville, Tennessee, a northbound train was scheduled to pass a southbound service from Memphis along a stretch of double track. That particular morning, the Memphis train did not appear as scheduled. The northbound engineer should have stopped before the double track merged into a single track to wait until the southbound service had passed. Then it would have been safe for him to use the single track northward. For reasons unknown to this day, the engineer did not wait. A half a mile further along the line, he came around a blind curve, and before he had time to apply the brakes, the train smashed into one another at a combined impact speed of 100 miles per hour. Initial estimates put the number of dead at 121, but the official count eventually reached 101, there were also 171 others who were injured. Most victims were World War I gunpowder factory workers. An investigation of the crash concluded that the number of casualties at the Nashville train wreck would have been far fewer if the cars had been made of steel. The steel car was invented in the 19th century, but it didn't come into common usage on railways for a long time, and when it did come into use, it uh, was mainly used for the more luxury cars, the Pullmans, the cars that the well-to-do of the day would ride in. In the 1918 wreck, most of the people who died were among the poorer folks who were riding in the wooden coaches. It is believed the responsibility for the disaster belonged to the conductor and engineer of the northbound train out of Nashville. Because they disregarded the rules, the victims paid the price. The heart of a steam locomotive is its boiler. If the proper balance of fire and water is maintained, the boiler will provide a steady supply of high pressure steam to the engine cylinders. The pistons inside the cylinders then force the drive wheels to turn and the train moves. If, however, the water level is allowed to drop too far, the boiler will overheat. Its metal walls will soften and crack and it will explode with enormous force. Relatively few train accidents were the result of boiler explosions. But one such accident did occur at a workshop in San Antonio, Texas, on March 18, 1912. A locomotive that had been overhauled was in the process of being tested. Its boiler suddenly burst, and the engine, as well as several surrounding buildings, were completely destroyed. One 16,000-pound chunk of metal came down nearly a quarter of a mile away from the blast site. A nearby house was smashed by a huge piece of the engine. 28 people were killed and 40 more were injured. An official finding stated that excessive pressure due to low water level in the boiler caused the explosion. Another boiler explosion happened in 1934 near Powelton, West Virginia. On December 27th, employees of the Elkhorn Piney Coal Mining Company and their families were returning home on the company's train. Without warning, the engine's boiler exploded. After being thrown into the air, it came down on top of the first coach of the train. 17 passengers were crushed and died under its weight. An additional 43 people were severely injured. By the end of the 1930s, the transition from steam to diesel-powered locomotives had just begun. In 1939, one of the most notorious train wrecks in American history involved the diesel-electric streamliner known as the City of San Francisco. <laughs> 
Owned by Union Pacific, it was among the most beautiful trains of its day, and it could make the 2,263-mile journey from Chicago, Illinois, to Oakland, California, in just under 40 hours. At 9.30 on the night of August 12th, the streamliner had just passed through Carlin, Nevada, heading west. Gliding along at 60 miles per hour, it started to cross a bridge over the Humboldt River when all of a sudden, the passenger cars began to derail and break loose from the engines. One after another, they crashed into the riverbed below. 24 dead passengers lay buried inside the mountain of wreckage. 115 others had sustained injuries. By morning, an investigation into the cause of the crash was underway. It quickly became clear that it was sabotage. The cars had jumped the track because a saboteur had removed a number of spikes and then pulled a rail out of alignment. A search of the river uncovered tools which were believed to have been used to move the displaced rail. They were typical tools used by railroad workers working on the track. So there was an immediate suspicion of a disgruntled worker. The investigation of this wreck took on almost a passion among the law enforcement people, the railroad people. They wanted to find who did this. Eventually, 1,144 major leads were investigated without luck. The railroad continued its investigation well into the 1950s, but although they believed the perpetrator of the crime was one of their own employees, the person who caused the wreck of the city of San Francisco was never caught. As the middle of the 20th century approached, safety measures, such as two-way radios for communication and automatic braking systems for stopping trains when an engineer missed a warning signal, were truly reducing the hazards of train travel. Still, disasters were not entirely eliminated. On February 18, 1947, the Red Arrow, one of Pennsylvania Railroad's so-called Blue Ribbon Fleet, crashed on an Allegheny mountainside. 23 people perished. The Red Arrow was more than an hour late on its way from Detroit to New York when it was hurled off the track at Bennington Curve. The Interstate Commerce Commission found that excessive speed had caused the train to derail. Excessive speed was the cause of another far more deadly derailment in 1951. A shambles of twisted steel near Woodbridge, New Jersey is the stark picture of one of the worst railroad tragedies in the nation's history. Plunging 26 feet from a temporary trestle, the engine and eight cars of the crack broker special crashed down an embankment. The train was carrying a thousand passengers. The broker special was particularly crowded the evening of the wreck because a labor strike had closed down the operations of another railroad. Of the more than 1,000 people who were on board the train, 84 were killed and 350 sustained injuries. The temporary trestle where the train derailed had a reduced speed limit of 25 miles per hour. Later testimony indicated that the engineer knew about the trestle and its reduced speed limit. Nevertheless, the investigation determined the train was traveling at over 50 miles per hour when it derailed. There is one crash that has been called the all-time sensational runaway train wreck. It occurred on January 15, 1953. Thousands of visitors were on their way to the nation's capital to attend the presidential inauguration of Dwight D. Eisenhower. Some were arriving at Washington's Union Station on board Pennsylvania Railroad's Federal Express. As the train approached the station, the engineer applied the brakes. When they did not respond, he began to blast his horn to warn the train yard that disaster was imminent. There was just enough time for passengers on board the Federal to move to the rear of the train and for people in the station to run for their lives. Shortly thereafter, 
the Federal plowed into the building, destroying the station master's office and the main newsstand. After the train came to a halt, the station's floor gave way and the locomotive fell into the basement. 87 people were injured in the wreck of the Federal, but amazingly, not a single person was killed. Now, the Eisenhower inauguration was just a few days away. What do you do when you got a locomotive sitting in the basement of your station and most people are going to arrive by train for the inauguration? Well, you just build a floor over it. And a lot of people arrived for the Eisenhower inauguration and they wouldn't have been able to tell anything happened if it hadn't been for the newspaper stories. A few weeks later, the false floor was removed. The locomotive was lifted out and reassembled. It was then put back on the tracks and it continued to run for years. By the 1950s, the automobile had become the American way to get around. People were choosing to travel on the interstate highways, forsaking the steel tracks of the railroads. Gradually, passenger trains became fewer in number. The airline industry finished the job of wiping out most of what was left of train passenger service. As the number of people riding the rails diminished, fewer passengers were killed and injured in railroad accidents. The era when train disasters were commonplace had come to an end.